The still deeply unpopular former president has kept a low profile since leaving office in January 2009, but his emergence today of all days heading up a conference on tax policy and the economy uh, did put him squarely back into today's 2012 politics. If you raise taxes, in other words, if you let the, I wish they weren't called the Bush tax cuts. If they're called some other body's tax cuts, they're probably less likely to, to be raised. <laughs> <laughs> Former President Bush uh, should not be so modest about his legacy in the Republican Party. Not only does everybody still call them the Bush tax cuts, but this Republican Party, after him, is absolutely campaigning on keeping the Bush tax cuts. I mean, despite the decades so far of the Bush tax cuts exploding the national debt, adding trillions to the deficit. Remember, they said they were going to pass them because we had a surplus. We had extra money. That's how they justified passing them in the first place. Despite what the Bush tax cuts have done to the debt and the deficit, Paul Ryan and Mitt Romney's economic plan not only calls for keeping the Bush tax cuts in place, even for the wealthiest people in the country who, frankly, don't need more tax cuts. But they are not only keeping the Bush tax cuts in place, the Ryan Romney plan calls for doubling down on the most radical idea of the Bush tax cuts in the first place, which was to narrowly target the people who already have the most money in the country and focus intently on giving those people more taxpayer help than anybody else. The Ryan Romney plan would give the average millionaire, look at this, Ryan Romney plan would give the average millionaire $265,000 more dollars per year. Extending the Bush tax cuts would give those people a $129,000 tax cut per year. Paul Ryan and Mitt Romney are good with that, but then they want to add to it. They get to $265,000 because they are doubling down on that idea with their own additional rich people bonus tax present. Another quarter of a million dollars for every average millionaire. This is not the politics of the past anymore. Talking about George W. Bush right now is right at the center of today's Republican Party thinking and today's presidential politics. Today, President Obama was in Florida arguing for closing the loophole that lets people who make their money as financiers, people like Mitt Romney, uh, pay essentially mini tax rates instead of the tax rates that everybody else has to pay. I'm saying you're bringing in a million bucks or more a year then what the rule says is you should pay the same percentage of your income in taxes as middle-class families do. You shouldn't get special tax breaks. You shouldn't be able to get special loopholes. The president's proposal is sometimes shorthanded as the Buffett rule, named after Warren Buffett, who famously uh, pays a lower tax rate than his secretary does. I actually think it might stick better with people if they called it the Romney loophole rather than the Buffett rule. But in any case, President Obama's proposal would essentially leave the tax rate for rich people where it currently is. But it would close the loophole that prevents really, really rich people from actually paying that tax rate if they made their money in the Mitt Romney world of finance. It is a loophole specifically for people whose income comes from the financial sector. George W. Bush in Manhattan today weighed in on that as well. Uh, he gave the Republican Party standard line that it would be a mistake to raise any taxes on rich people because we need to ensure that rich people get as much money as possible because they are the job creators. So the more money rich people are given, the better off we all mysteriously are. To be clear, though, um, this is not about the overall tax rate on zillionaires going up. It is just a question about whether or not people who specifically make their zillions in hedge funds and private equity, like Mitt Romney did, whether or not they should pay a special mini tax rate that is even less than what other zillionaires pay. It's a very specific idea. The George W. Bush legacy is the central issue in partisan politics, certainly in Republican politics in this decade. And the way that has played out for Mitt Romney so far is things like Mitt Romney having to explain to Poppy Bush, to George H.W. Bush, that no, no, he hasn't received George W. Bush's endorsement. And then Barbara Bush has to interject and say, we'll talk about that later. And it's things like Mitt Romney having a bit of a political constraint on his ability to pivot to foreign policy in the campaign because his foreign policy advisors are essentially a roster of George W. Bush foreign policy guys. And when America thinks about the foreign policy of George W. Bush, they do not think good things. The central issue of this election, though, of course, is the economy, right? And today, on what I think is 
inarguably day one of the Romney versus Obama 2012 election. The day that Rick Santorum gets out of the race, the day that the path was cleared for Mitt Romney, today of all days, George W. Bush helpfully popped out of wherever he's been to hang the legacy of Bushonomics around Mitt Romney's neck. And that is a legacy that in part looks like this. Eight reckless debt exploding years of fiscal irresponsibility. The sort of image that not only hangs around Mitt Romney's neck, given that he wants to continue many of the same Bush economic policies, this is the sort of thing that also hangs around questions about whether or not somebody like Rob Portman or somebody like Mitch Daniels might have a chance at being Mr. Romney's vice presidential choice. The problem for each of them is that they were both George W. Bush budget guys, and the George W. Bush budget was not a pretty thing. This goes to the central question of what people think of when they feel aggravated about the state of the economy now. Do they think of the current president? Do they think of President Obama? That is what Republicans hope. But is there also a possibility that people think about George W. Bush and his economic legacy, his economic record? It's not just the national debt and deficit that President Bush left behind. This, for example, is median household income during the Bush administration. Median household income, as you can see, actually went down during the time that President Bush was in office. This is U.S. manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing jobs in the United States during the 1990s, heading into the year 2000, heading into the Bush administration. Here's what happened to manufacturing in the United States under President Bush. Yeah, disaster. The manufacturing sector is now rebounding under the current president. But look at what happened during the Bush administration. Throughout most of the 20th century, as American workers got more productive, their hourly wages increased as well, right? So if you did more over the course of the hour, you got paid more for that hour. Worker productivity and hourly wages were sort of tied together, as you can see there. What happened during the Bush years? Yeah, look at that. Worker productivity skyrockets, hourly wages remain totally flat. There was one silver lining uh, during the Bush years, though. There was one economic exception to these rules. Quote, the sole exception to the 2001 to 2007 period's lackluster performance was the growth of corporate profits. Corporate profits experienced average annual growth of 10.8% as compared with average growth of 7.4% for other comparable post-war periods. So corporations and rich people did great under George W. Bush. Everybody else pretty much got left behind. That is the economic legacy of the George W. Bush years, a legacy which, uh, from the perspective of the Mitt Romney campaign, probably could have picked a better day to crawl out of exile and start making news. I have decided to stay out of the limelight. I mean, I had plenty of the limelight. I, I don't think it's good, frankly, for our country to undermine our president, and I don't intend to do so, but I do intend to remain involved in areas that I'm interested in. Joining us now is Ezra Klein, columnist for The Washington Post and Bloomberg News, and of course an MSNBC policy analyst. Ezra, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. How are you? Good. Um, I was surprised to see George W. Bush surface today because of its political impact, but it, it got me thinking about what he's advocating. I mean, he did weigh into today's policy fights. The Bush tax cuts were originally presented as a way of paying down the surplus. We had mm -hmm. spare money, so we should spend it on a big tax cut. What's the impact now of extend, further extending or doubling down on those kinds of cuts uh, now versus what the situation was 11 years ago? The impact is, um, uh, for, the, for the first part, $4 trillion in debt. Over 10 years, extending the Bush tax cuts would create $4 trillion in debt. I think it is important to say that nobody has seriously put on the table specific spending cuts that equal $4 trillion. And that is what you would need to do just to climb out of the hole you're creating. So for Republicans who say the whole question here is deficits, that is really what is holding the economy back, if you extend all the Bush tax cuts, you've, be, you've dug a $4 trillion hole for yourself that you need to get out of before you can begin doing anything else. So that is the first piece. The second bit is that the problems of Bush tax cuts were there to solve. Whether or not you think they worked, and I don't think the 2000s were a particularly great economic year, are not the problems we have now. The Bush tax cuts were developed at a time we had very large surpluses, we had a roaring economy, the idea was they were going to supercharge investment going forward. Then we had a, a light recession due to the 2001 busting of the tech bubble. They were supposed to give us insurance there. What we have now, whatever else you think about it, is not an investment-driven recession. We have a recession of the middle class. We have a recession, or no longer a recession, but a continued economic downturn, a continued sluggish economy in which consumer spending is not recovering. And giving money to the folks at the top is not how you make the middle spend again. It is not suited 
for our current economic problems. Well, in terms of our current economic problems, not only, as you described, the recession of the middle class, but also the problem of people at the bottom end of the economic spectrum uh, doing incredibly poorly, forgive the mm -hmm. phrase, but not only high economic, high, pol uh, high poverty rates, but also a lot of bad socioeconomic indicators that go along with poverty that isn't short term, but that is extending into a years long problem. I is the Ryan and Romney economic plan uh, any better for economic inequality for people at the bottom of the income scale than the policies of the Bush years were. Is that anything on which no. they've had a bit of a course correction? It, it, is, it is vastly worse. And, and this is an important point to make because George W. Bush ran in part as a reaction to Newt Gingrich and the Republicans of the 1990s who were considered cruel because they wanted to cut so deep into Medicaid, so deep into welfare and other, and other social programs. And so he said in his campaign, I will not, budget the, I will not balance the budget on the backs of the poor. And he didn't. What he came in is he increased deficit spending, but he did not pay for his tax cuts or his other spending by cutting Medicaid or cutting food stamps or cutting the earned income tax credit. In fact, he expanded food stamps. He actually expanded the Medicare prescription drug program, creating it in the first place, and did much more than that. What Romney and Ryan have both proposed at this point is to extend the Bush tax cuts, so $4 trillion there, add a couple trillion dollars more in tax cuts, so now you're six, seven trillion dollars. And the way you actually pay for that is you cut into programs for the poor. The only specific cuts they have really named, the main ones they have named are into Medicare, or I'm sorry, are into Medicaid, are into food stamps, are into housing subsidies, are into job training. They talk about it in terms of what they call block granting, but the real secret behind it is they give the money to the states and then say that money cannot grow as quickly as the programs are supposed to grow. That is where their actual savings come from. So where George W. Bush didn't balance the budget on the backs of the poor by not balancing the budget, Romney and Ryan, and there's just no way to get around this, the only plan they have put forward for balancing the budget, given their tax plan, is on the backs of the poor. It is a shift, but it is not in the right direction. It's the, taking the compassionate conservatism thing, deciding that didn't work out, and so deciding right. the thing that you're going to drop is the compassion part. Right. Um, Ezra Klein, columnist for The Washington Post and Bloomberg News, uh, and our great asset here as, at MSNBC as a policy analyst. Ezra, thank you very much. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right. It turns out one area where President George W. Bush did make some positive electoral headway for his party uh, is an area that is specifically and aggressively being abandoned by Mitt Romney. Adios, elefantes. That's next. Tonight on The Interview, Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa joins me right here in his town. Straight, straight ahead. Stick around for that. Plus, we've got a best new thing in the world coming up. All ahead. Today, the skies opened, the sun broke through, the clear day dawned for Mitt Romney when Rick Santorum, his last even remotely conceivably maybe plausible rival, conceded the race. For Mitt Romney, who has had an unexpectedly difficult time this year shaking what was frankly always a pretty weak field of rivals, it must have felt like a ray of warm sunshine beaming down on him after being caught out in a cold rain. What a relief, right? And then... Today, all of a sudden, new cloud, rogue cloud. Today, seriously, today, George W. Bush had to pick today to rejoin Republican politics? If you raise taxes, in other words, if you let the, I wish they weren't called the Bush tax cuts. If they're called some other body's tax cuts, they're probably less likely to, to be raised. <laughs> Former President George W. Bush re-emerging from his post-White House exile to put himself back in the news, back in the center of Republican politics. And this has two main negatives for the Republican Party's now de facto nominee, Mitt Romney. First and most obviously, there is the overall challenge for Republicans of Americans as a whole associating the Republican Party with the George W. Bush years. Uh, with the Iraq War, with the worst financial catastrophe since the Great Depression, with torture, with astronomical deficits, with, 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 choose your poison. The last time the nation had a choice between Barack Obama and a Republican Party still mostly associated with George W. Bush, the George W. Bush era Republican Party lost in a landslide. Today, the party's nominee from that year was on the Turkish border with Syria, demanding that the United States get into another war in the Middle East. The Republicans' vice presidential nominee from that year today 
is still Sarah Palin every day. She does not work in politics anymore except as a commentator on the conservative cable TV network Fox News. So problem one for Mitt Romney in having George W. Bush re-entering Republican politics today, hosting his big economic conference with all sorts of Republican boldface names today, uh, what was supposed to be Mitt Romney's big day in the sun? Problem one is that this was the last day in the world the Romney campaign would want America to have a big visual reminder of George W. Bush Republicanism. But beyond the problem of there being bad things about the George W. Bush era that Republicans do not want to remind the country about right now, Mitt Romney also has a different problem.